You want to brew like a world champion? Well, you came to the right place. What does that even mean, brewing like a world champion? Well, for those of you that aren't familiar, there is actually an organization that hosts a World Brewers Cup competition every year. There are over 50 participating countries in this. Each one has their own organized national championship. The winners of each one come together in a different place around the world every year in order to compete. Now, oftentimes, these brew recipes that end up winning the world championships get a little bit famous amongst the home brewers because they figure if it's good enough for a world champion, it's good enough for my kitchen. But is that the case? Is it actually like that? Is that how brewing works, where someone finds a code to crack and then you just need to apply it to your coffee and boom, you have world championship level coffee? The answer is not so simple. Yes, it is. The, the answer is no, but the reasoning is not so simple. For those of you that don't know, these competitions tend to be quite elitist in a way. They're inaccessible because the winners tend to be using coffees that cost multiple hundred dollars per pound of green. Very oftentimes it's it's well over that. I know people who've, who've competed with a thousand dollar per pound green coffee and more. These coffees that are winning these competitions are not your normal coffee and it's not that they're absolutely delicious. And in fact, I, I go to these world competitions very often. I've coached competitors in these who have finished very well in the top six. And these coffees are not necessarily ones I even enjoy. They're heavily processed, which just means that they have been fermented in a very aggressive way. Sometimes with fruits added into it, which give a very artificial flavor to it, but they're all made in a way that is to optimize the score sheet. That's what this whole competition is about, is to optimize the score sheet. So whatever coffee you are using, you are trying to brew it in a way that makes it easy for the judges to give you as many points as possible from the score sheet. So that includes aroma, body, mouthfeel, aftertaste, flavor when it's hot, when it's medium, when it's cool. The way that you do that, you take a coffee that's incredibly loud in the way it tastes. Now, what does that mean loud? When you taste it, there are obvious intense flavor notes that most people would be able to pick up. Now, I know that a lot of us, our story into specialty coffee is that one blueberry bomb natural Ethiopia where we were like, oh my God, I didn't know coffee could taste like this. That's what these competitors are trying to recreate on stage because, well, they have judges from around the world, from different cultures, different food backgrounds that are judging their coffee. So they have to pick a coffee with very obvious notes so that they can get the points. And essentially, the person with the best routine, the best workflow, the most sensory uniformity across the cups, and most importantly, the most accurate flavor notes and best tasting coffee wins. What are these coffees that usually win? Very often they're uh, of the geisha varietal, the cedra varietal. They're very often from um, Colombia, Panama. Those tend to be very famous origins for these coffees that come from. Sometimes it's from Ethiopia, but a lot of the times they're incredibly heavily processed coffees. So that the brewing of these coffees is not something I would actually recommend implementing. Since about 2017 or so, that's when these coffees really started to come forward. In the past few years, it's become really intense. There is a species called eugenoides that almost tastes artificially sweet. I know of competitors who have used that to like kind of spike their coffee to increase the sweetness without even really disclosing that it was in the coffee. There are a lot of things that go on behind the scenes where competitors are trying to optimize the score sheet by way of using heavily processed or funky varieties in order to make their cup taste more intense. So the way that they're brewing is a way to make sure that the process is what is showing first and foremost, and not necessarily origin or terroir or the varietal characteristics. Turn around now and dance, dance, dance. Whenever you see a brew recipe from the World Brewers Cup Championship, likely it is designed to allow the process to be the most vibrant in the cup and not necessarily the coffee. I have actually taken the measurements of a lot of coffees at these competitions and they tend to be around 17 or 18% extraction. Your normal off the shelf coffee does not taste very good at that low of an extraction. Usually you want to hit around 20, 21, 22% for it to get the sweetness and the acidity and the balance that we kind of look for in a good cup of coffee. But a lot of these, because they're not normal cups of coffee, they don't require that. In fact, if you extract too much of the coffee itself, it overtakes the processing, which is what is giving them their points. I know that Ted Tsukasia back in 2015 when he won the Japanese Brewers Cup Championship, he used a one to four ratio on an AeroPress and then he bypassed with like 80 grams of water. 
a one to four ratio. That, that is obviously trying to increase acidity, increase body, because back then on the score sheet, your acidity calls, your body, and one other note would, had to double the points. So literally everything on your score sheet had one time point, one times point, one times point. And then when you hit acidity and body, you would get double your points. And so he was optimizing the score sheet by creating a brew that would optimize body and acidity. You under extract a coffee with a super heavy concentration, you're gonna have a super high body, super high acidity. And so he gets double the points. To brew like a world champion, essentially you're doing lower temperature, really tight ratios, really high TDS, low extraction yield. And the reason for this is you're gonna have a heavy mouthfeel with high TDS. You're gonna have very clear notes and very low astringency with a low extraction. And with low temperature, you're not really gonna cause any of that bitterness to come out, any of those um, negatively tasting chlorogenic type of acids. That's kind of my rant on why it's not the best practice to replicate completely the recipes you see in the World Brewers' Cup Championship. Now, of course, some are gonna work at home, especially because oftentimes people at home have less than great grinders. A lot of these recipes on the world stage call for super coarse grounds, and it's because they're not trying to push extraction. So at home, if you have a really low quality grinder, it might work really well for you because grinding coarser is gonna be a better job because of the grind quality. To give you a better idea of how this all works, I'm gonna actually show you the way I approached helping Kian Hickman, the Danish Brewers' Cup champion, to dial in his coffee for the World Championship this year in 2023. I'm filming this just a day before I leave for Athens for the World Championship where I'm head coaching him. Hopefully he does really well. But anyway, I'll show you how I helped him dial in his coffee, which is a beautiful washed Bolivian Gesha, very different from the typical coffees, and his whole theme is centered around getting away from from this process-driven cut profile. It is a very clean floral style coffee that is not in vogue with how the world championships work. We had a script kind of center around this idea that washed process is the only real way to, to experience the raw product. But even with that, we have to be smart and we have to optimize the score sheet. So we want to ensure that the notes are really intense. The question is, how do we optimize the recipe? Now, I'll tell you when Kian first uh, gave me his recipe, he gave me 16 grams of coffee to 250 grams of water um, at 93 degrees Celsius. So I brewed it and it was a nice cup. It was something that I would expect to be served if I went to a cafe that was serving a really nice Gesha. So if I paid 10 bucks for a cup, I would feel good getting this cup. It was very floral, very tea-like, but overall it was lacking in intensity across the board. The body was much too tea-like. It had a little bit of a drying finish. There were just different aspects of it that would not score well. We need to figure out a way to intensify all of this without adding any astringency and without taking away from the integral nature of the whole routine, which is the delicacy and the transparency of washed processes. Now, Kian's recipe of 16 gram dose in the dripper that he was using had quite a shallow bed, and that was the first thing that I considered. If I'm trying to increase the intensity, increase the body, the first thing I need to do is increase the dose. I want a deeper bed. The bed is the number one way to filter your coffee. It is absolutely incredible. And the way that you can test this is if you brew, say, a French press, and then you pour the French press through a V60 filter, it's gonna take a long, 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 long time to drain. And that's because a lot of those fines get through that mesh filter and enter the paper filter and it clogs it. Well, all those fines are also in your normal brew with a V60, but the V60 doesn't take 10 minutes to drain. Why is that? It's because the bed is filtering those out. So we need a thicker bed for better cake filtration to ensure that we have a cleaner cup without that dryness at the end. This also opens us up to the potential of a more even extraction. When you have such a shallow bed, it's easy to disrupt it in a way that's almost irreparable whenever you're pouring with a heavy flow of water. When you have that deeper bed, there's just more of a stable base in order to help with an even extraction through that bed from top to bottom. Since this is a flat bottom brewer, we're going in kind of a stratified way that I show in my previous video here, showing kind of how flat bottom brewers kind of extract. So in his brewer, he used a flat filter to go against the wall so that it would lessen bypass as much as possible, again, contributing to a more even extraction. And then he also increased the hole size, the hole diameter, 
of each of these exit holes on the bottom to ensure for a faster flow out. Because we are slowing down the flow by uh, putting the filter against the wall, we need to increase the flow with the holes coming out. And then erase the center right here on the inside to disallow the filter from sagging and clogging those holes. My gut desire was to move to a conical shaped brewer because I wanted to push the body while also getting loads of clarity and ensure that we still have that tea-like uh, delicate cup of coffee that a Geshe normally gives. I was scared with this because at that 16 to 250 that it was muting too much of that nuance and was giving us too much body and was almost turning chocolatey, which is not really what you want when you're trying to showcase the variety and the origin through a routine. He was very set on wanting to keep this since MK Studio kind of made these differences for him. We need to updose and we need to play around with ratios a bit in order to optimize this. We need to play around with pore sizes, pore speeds, etc. Now what we ended on was 20 gram dose to 300 grams of water where we do 75 gram pour for the bloom at about a six to seven grams per second pour to optimize turbulence because in these competitions you don't want to add any agitation because they'll count off if you don't exactly uh, replicate it from cup to cup so if I do one swirl on the first one and the second one I do one and a half they'll notice and mark you off the second pour after 45 seconds was 75 grams again essentially emulating the first pour giving you something like that double bloom that I kind of championed in my Kono video, I found out that this coffee was really insoluble. The easiest way I found that out is I was using a refractometer, and so even with fine grounds and lots of pours, I was still barely hitting 20% extraction. I decided that we needed to have a really long early phase where we didn't waste a ton of water. So we opted to use 50% of the water within the first uh, about minute and a half. The final pour of 150 grams, we were able to have all the gases already expelled so we didn't have to worry about the bubbles going upwards causing channels, and we could just really work on that deep extraction of the acids and other elements inside the coffee through diffusion and to give us that final cup that had the strength to give us a good body score, that had the clarity, that had the acidity, that had the sweetness to really optimize our score sheet. That final pour was about 12 grams a second, pouring pr pretty much as quick as you can from a kettle fellow in order to really increase the agitation, turning the bed over and over again so that we can really push the extraction there. Because this coffee is so insoluble, we needed to increase the temperature. So from the 93 he was using, we went up to 100. The idea was to make those molecules a little bit more excited, to help open up the pores a little bit more quickly, to ensure that we could have a quick brew while also being efficient in our extraction. And of course, inside of all this, you wanna take care of your water. So with this, it was automatic what we were gonna do. We used Coffee Collective's specific water profile, which is essentially 15 to 20 parts per million overall. So we did play around with the general hardness and the carbonate hardness within in that total PPM, and we ended up deciding on 10 parts per million as calcium chloride, 10 parts per million as magnesium chloride, and five parts per million as potassium bicarbonate. And that was what we found tasted best with this as far as expressive florality, as far as complexity, sweetness, body, etc. We used the Pietro with the Pro Brew Burrs. And we also had to play around with a lot of grind sizes. Grind heavily dictates that extraction yield. If you went too coarse in order to get rid of some of that astringency, you ended up with a more tea-like body. If you went finer and you introduced some of the astringency, you were able to get more of what you wanted, but then you had that drying finish. So it was a very delicate balance and it ended up pushing us to a shorter ratio than we would normally do with really lightly roasted coffees. And in the end, our extraction yield was only 18.5%, which goes to show you that these numbers don't mean that much except for a guiding principle. Normally, I don't enjoy coffees that low of an extraction, but I've noticed with the Esmeralda Gesha and the Takesi Gesha from Coffee Collective, I've not enjoyed past 20%. There's so many variables that you have to take into account, and over time you'll notice which things kind of uh, impact the coffee differently, whether it's increasing the pour number or decreasing the pour number, whether it's increasing your pour speed, decreasing pour speed, going with laminar flow, turbulent flow, going with hotter water, cooler water, in which case I would highly recommend doing it in increments of a minimum of five degrees Celsius, otherwise you won't really notice much of a difference. Whether that's going for a finer grind size or a coarser grind size, I like to opt for coarser than finer uh, and go finer and, uh, if you're you know, lacking on body or something like that. We use the Pietro, which we'll go ahead and grind this up now, and then we'll get to brewing. Now, will this work with all coffees? Absolutely not. Is this something that you should give a try? Sure, why not? We're gonna dump our coffee in here. 
get our 20 grams. There we go. I'm going to just shake it level. Our water's off the boil, and then we'll go ahead and start. So as you see, I'm pouring about six or seven grams a second, and I'm doing it from a height to ensure that I'm maximizing turbulence up to about 75, there we go. Now, this is where I'm allowing the water to fully enter those grounds as much as it can, and it is beginning to degas the coffee so that diffusion can begin to occur. Just like in cupping, when we add hot water to these grounds that are freshly ground, you're going to have that crust form, essentially these hardened grounds at the top where gases are being trapped just below. Since they go upwards, obviously, that can cause channeling through our bed. So if we're doing a big pour for our second one, that can cause issues. So as you see here, we have those gas bubbles coming up. So on our second pour of 75 at around that same flow rate, we are able to release all those gases. So we're further priming the grounds for that full extraction, for that diffusion to occur by ridding the grounds of the CO2. Now we're getting rid of the gases that are trapped in the bed so that we can lessen the chances for, uh, for, for channeling. Then at a minute 30, so every 45 seconds we're pouring, we're going to pour incredibly heavily to hit that 300 grams uh, within about 12 seconds or so. So the bed is now dried out at about a minute 18. About a minute 30, we're going to pour the rest of our water. All right, so here we go. And I'm going to pour roughly in the middle since there's that little dip there. It can kind of help spread out the flow. But I'm just going to kind of sit in the center, just behind center, since we have an angle of that stream coming out. And I'm just pouring incredibly quickly to flip that bed. There we go, up to 300. I'm not touching it because again, the agitation can count off if you do it differently between the brewers. Now I know that a lot of you are also just curious about how flavor notes go uh, within the competition, what all you're doing in the competition, what happens in the 10 minute script. Essentially, you're trying to present the coffee as well as your approach to the coffee in as much detail as possible. So you're talking about why you chose this brewer, why this filter, why this water temperature, why this water chemistry, why this grinder, why this grind size, why, 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 why? Why are you pouring that much at that time? Why do you want this much uh, for the drawdown? The most important part of the whole script is your flavor note calls. How it hits your palate when it's at its hottest temperature, so around 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. How it changes when it hits warm, which is around 50 Celsius. And they want to know what it tastes like when it's cool, which is around 30 Celsius. So first you'll give the aroma calls and you'll hand over your decanter or the cup so that they can observe those calls. With this coffee, I get a nice white peach, I get some jasmine and bergamot, and I get floral honey. It's got a really nice sweet character to it and incredibly floral. After that, you'll serve the coffee and you can start with your flavor notes. The way I like to present notes is I like to start with obviously the temperature gradient. So I'll do what the flavor is and what the aftertaste is of hot, then with warm, flavor, aftertaste, then with cool, flavor, aftertaste. Then you go into acidity calls. Now with acidity, you wanna talk about the intensity. Is it low intensity, medium intensity, high intensity? Is it low medium, is it medium high, what is it? And so you give them the intensity, you talk about the different aspects of the acidity in the cup that qualify as different fruits. So you could say the intensity is similar to the citric acidity in a, in a bite of lemon. Now that doesn't mean lemon, it tastes like lemon, it means the acidity level in a lemon is what this it makes you think of. And maybe it's like malic, like a red delicious apple. Maybe it's phosphoric, like sipping a co Coca-Cola, makes your mouth water. But that doesn't mean that this tastes like that. It just reminds you of the acidity level of those different acids. And then you talk about the acidity as it changes. If it gets cool, does it get more intense? Does it get less intense? Does the citric turn malic? Does the malic turn citric? Do they meld together to create something like a pineapple that has both citric and malic? What's happening there? You want to describe using your words this kind of melding of the flavors or the separation of the flavors as it cools. Then you go into kind of body and mouth feel. And in this case, you're talking about the weight of the coffee. Is the coffee low in weight, medium weight, high in weight? Like, is it heavy? Is it like a yogurt or is it like a kefir or is it like a tea? What does it, what, or skin milk? How does it feel on your tongue weight wise, right? Then we go into mouth feel. Is it round? Is it velvety? Is it silky? Is it coating? Is it drying? What is going on in the mouth to your tongue, to your palate as you're experiencing it? Does it change as it goes from hot to warm to cool? 
cool? Or does it stay the same? Or does it kind of vanish? Is there some sort of like tartaric acid phenomenon going on, kind of like with a red wine? Or is it really smooth and cooling? Does it have a cooling effect, kind of like a mint? Is it breathy or is it heavy? What's happening with the mouthfeel? You kind of name all these things which lead you into the balance. And the judges really want to hear you articulate, is the cut balanced? Is the acidity, the mouthfeel, the body, the, the sweetness, uh, the aftertaste, are they all kind of playing off one another in a harmonious fashion? Or is one a little bit higher than the other? Are you trying to showcase one of them? The idea here is you want to use your words to craft a sentence that shows you have put thought behind the way this is constructed, that the sweetness and the acidity are held together by an enveloping body, which showcases a balance that is only found within this specific washed coffee. So you're trying to present the coffee in a way that it's singular, that it's unique, that it's the only coffee you could be presenting today because your passion for it overrides anything else in the world. Then the judges taste. Now, of course, you can give them tasting instructions. You can give them a spoon and say, taste from the spoon when you're judging the acidity and then everything else from the cup. You can tell them, taste from the cup only for body and everything else from the spoon. You can say, taste only from the spoon for all of it or only from the cup for all of it. Whatever you think is going to affect their sensorial experience the most, that's what you want to go with. Enjoy using the works of the coffee sensorium, Fabiana. She puts out some really great things as regards how someone interprets sensory information and how it affects their sensory experience. So for instance, there is science behind what this orange and white cup can do to how you'll perceive the flavor. There is science behind how the texture of the cup will go to affect your experience of the body, the mouthfeel of the coffee. And so you can rely on these sciences in order to increase your presentation and the experience of the judges. This competition is so pointed to the score sheet. It really has very little relevance to home brewing. It is all specified to the coffee that's being presented. Of course, it's fun to go and see what the winning brewer cup recipe was and to replicate it at home, but what I'm trying to show you in this video is not only how this competition works, but how little relevance it plays on the lives of you at home using coffee that is coffee. Coffee that we buy off the shelf, coffee that's 15 bucks a bag, 20 bucks a bag, not coffee that's $300 a bag that you can't find even if you wanted to buy it. What are these competitions for? Are they even helpful? The idea is to have the winner be an ambassador for specialty coffee to the world. And, 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 and with that idealistic framework, I think it's a beautiful thing and something that I really want to grow. I want more and more people to drink specialty coffee. That is my biggest passion. That's one of the reasons I started this YouTube. It's the main reason I am still working in coffee to this day. I have a passion to spread specialty coffee to increase the prices of coffee across the world so that farmers are not being paid commodity price, but they're able to have a sustainable wage. And so I believe in it. And if that is the true goal of these competitions, I am here for it. There seems to be a little bit of debate going on. Are these competitions turning more and more into a, a, a show where you whoever has the most money to flash are the winners? Or is it something that actually is sustainable? All I know is I enjoy helping competitors figure out ways to present routines that I think can have an impact. I believe in the message that Kian is trying to send and that washed coffees should not be a relic of the past. They are an accessible way of processing coffee for farmers around the world who either are new to it, taking over for relatives or are who have been in it for a while and just want to continue using this method that they have a process in place for without having to invest a lot of their own money and time and energy to figure out a new way of keeping up with the market. I love washed coffees. I love the message that Kian sends with his Team. I hope you have a chance to watch it online somewhere. There's a link. I will have it below. Otherwise, thank you for watching. I hope that you have a lovely day and brew something tasty. Cheers.